to another episode of the Young Professionals podcast, everyone. Uh, Luke and Sarge here again. Sarge, who are we speaking with today? Luke, today we're speaking to Hugh Beard. Hugh is a product delivery coach at Zero, a leading provider of accounting solutions for small businesses. Hugh's first piece of industry education was growing up within a small family business where he felt very lucky to see firsthand an, a sex, successful entrepreneurial story, but also the sacrifices that that requires. After finishing high school, Hugh did a Bachelor of Business. Not knowing what path to take, Hugh moved to the US where he worked a number of jobs, including at Apple Retail as a tech support member and then a manager of the tech support section of the Apple Fifth Avenue in New York City. Upon moving back to Australia, Hugh joined Seek, working across customer support and then data analysis within Seek's artificial intelligence and platform services team. Looking to shift into a more strategy-focused role, Hugh completed his MBA at Monash University. After completing his MBA, Hugh moved to consulting with a small boutique firm named Agile 11, now New 21, and then jumped across to his current role as a product delivery coach at Zero. Hugh, welcome to the show. Cheers. Thank you for having me. Super excited. Thanks for coming on, mate. Uh, jump straight into it. Uh, you're at Zero and you're a product delivery coach. What does a product delivery coach do and what does a day in the life of a product delivery coach look like? Yeah, good question. Um, So as a product delivery coach, um, I really see the role in in two parts. So the first part is trying to make sure that work for our our product development teams uh, is an awesome experience and it's just a really enjoyable place. Like we're we're having the right conversations, we're breaking down work really effectively. Um, uh, you, You know, we're building really great culture and we're adopting all the best practices from a work perspective. So really, I would view that as like happy teams, really productive teams. And then the other part is a bit more of a strategic role, which is um, really helping the product development um, function at zero. So just understanding how can we build really beautiful products that um, create a lot of customer value, and by doing that, create a lot of business value. So they're, they're sort of the two facets. It's almost like wearing two hats. So, sometimes it's very low level, like trying to get everyone to, 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 to see the bigger picture or, or buy in. And then the other times it's quite strategic as, hey, does this structure work or, or should, should we be interviewing customers earlier on or getting feedback on prototypes? So. And when, when you're looking to build beautiful products at zero, what, what sorts of things are running through your head? Yeah, good question. Um, so the, some of the things running through my head are um, in software development, quite often um, the, the problem is identified quite far away from the team doing the actual work. So I'm thinking quite a lot of saying, how, how can we make sure that people building the products really understand that problem? Um, but also how can we make sure that the people building the products can provide that feedback to the strategist or to the product managers as well? Um, and, and it might just be something as simple as, Hey, like that, like building that makes a lot of sense, but there's these five, five other things that are dependent upon it. What are we doing about that? Or, or, um, like, Hey, we've got a similar solution to that, that we can build much quicker. Like what, why don't we do that? So I think really, um, some big bits are um, making sure all the parts of the uh, product development function are really aligned, uh, talking to each other and, and, and working really well together because it's not uncommon that someone writes up a problem, throws it over the wall, gets built, and then all of a sudden um, a customer don't find it valuable and a business has spent phenomenal amounts of, of money building it. It, it sounds like you've got a bunch of different stakeholders that you're dealing with there. Who who are the key uh, players in terms of building products at zero? Yeah. Um, so the the main stakeholders typically, like I would say at the core of it is a customer. So um, want to make sure that the, the a, a stakeholder that we're engaging is, is a customer. So getting really early feedback, um, spending a lot of time understanding that problem. Um, in full disclosure, I think that's something that a lot of companies talk about, um, and that's something I'm really focusing on at, at, at Zero is is, is um, 
how, how can we make sure our teams have access to customers and can, can get really fast feedback on that. Another stakeholder is um, a really big piece is um, what we would call as our product team. So that is essentially the business person that sits within a technology team that um, is really looking for that, that business value um, and making sure that what we're building customers love and are therefore prepared to pay or, or are therefore fi find valuable. And then the, the, the last part is the, um, the, the development team or the dev team. So that is your programmers, it's your analysts, it's your, your data peeps, um, it's design. And so really a, a really big cross-functional team. So um, that, that's it. Um, but I'd also say like it, they, they sort of go in increasing sort of seniority. So um, dev team, but quite often the problems or things that we need to help with are, are, are quite senior. So um, whether that's structure or things of that nature, um, having those conversations with executives or, or general managers. On the uh, topic of product generally, Hugh, and I think to add some color to people who maybe haven't had exposure to you know tech companies and, and what they actually do before, do you want to run through what Zero focuses on and, and the products that they actually uh, deliver to their customers and what problem they're solving? But then in terms of product, so can you explain at, uh, I guess, a bit of a higher level what a product is in terms of it, it, it in a tech company? And for that, um, you know, I think a lot of people who haven't worked in those industries before might not really realize that say if you take you know instagram as an example like the like button is a product for for those people and that that kind of thing so it can get quite granular do you want to run us through that yeah so um what zero does is zero is uh it was first really known as a cloud accounting um software and um i would say what I would probably classify zero more as now is a small business platform that at its core is, is um, a bunch of accounting based products. And why I mentioned small business platform is now zero recently acquired a business that um, is a lending marketplace. Um, we, uh, we do payroll. Um, so we saw, we solve a bunch of problems that are adjacent to that core accounting but like at its very core, um, uh, Zero built a, plat uh, a product that um, meant that small business owners could add their add their um, tax documents, um, keep their books up to date, and then their um, accountants and bookkeepers, if they had those, would really easily be able to log in and adjust that, um, monitor that, and and do do what they need to do for that. Um, Zero adopted a platform strategy, which essentially just means um, they figured out there's a bunch of stuff that are really valuable that they don't want to do, or, or they think that other people are, are, are much more specialized and they can do that. So there's all these really cool kind of plugins as well, like Stripe or, um, or Go Cardless is another really big one. So that's, that's what Zero does. We, we, we build a platform that really um, powers small business and at the core is uh, an accounting platform. Cool. And then, then the second part of that question was more of a, I don't know, that, that was a quite elaborate question. So no, I apologize no, no. for that. All good, all good. <laughs> um, but let, let's talk to what um, particularly products are at, at tech companies yeah. and how granular they can be. Why don't you step us through what, what they are and how they're kind of developed? Yeah. So I, I, I think in terms of um, uh, when, when you refer to products, it is literally... Um, uh, a, a digital or a software-based product um, that, that customers find valuable. And so um, like what Luke mentioned, it, they can be super, super granular. So like a really good example is, um, so I worked at Seek. Um, so Seek had a, um, a it's a, a two-sided marketplace. And one side of that is you would have a team whose product is the profile. So if you sign into Seek, where you store your data, there was one team that that managed that, and then, um, and then when you went to the job ad, ad side, there was there was a, a search bar, and, and so that that's a product team. Um, there, uh, like literally, how all the jobs are posted, that's a job ad team. Um, uh, you, you know um, how 
um, how really large customers post is slightly different. And, and so that's another product there. Um, so pr pretty much if, if you go to a major, um, a, a major website, um, almost all the things that you interact with will probably be independent products of some, some sort, just depending on, on, on the scale. Um, yeah, I think that, so I, I'd say like, um, when I think of product, I, I would say, um, they, they can be cut up in all different shapes and sizes. Um, but we typically, um, how, how we structure teams around products, um, it's typically you, you want one team that can, um, work on that product without interfering with, with other teams, um, or they're not dependent upon other teams to, to deliver their, their products or their improvements. And, and so I'd say that's, that's probably a really, really key piece is um, uh, if, if a team is limited or dependent on other, other teams, you you'd typically split that product out then. So, so a, a team can really focus on that problem and, and, and move really, really quickly and make quick iterations on it. And just to go full circle as a product delivery coach, you're responsible for uh, organizing all those team members and delivering that product. I, I, um, I just pick up on one word. So organizing. So um, like as a coach, I'm, uh, I would say a really key part of my role is I don't have manager power. I don't have um, like, I, I'm technically not a team member. Um, and, and I definitely don't have any, um, I definitely don't have any sort of decision-making power. Really what my role is, is um, so a lot of those product teams that I work with, I'm just trying to foster the right conversations to re reveal problems. So quite often I use data to do that or um, even just asking really, really obvious questions that maybe no one, no one else wants to ask. Um, uh, th that that's, that that's largely my role is to um, be within be within um, the team's operating space and just be observing things that maybe people are missing. M maybe there's a little bit of tension there, like how can I help? Um, but also sort of um, taking that really tactical work and making sure that we're remembering the big picture or we're remembering the strategy or we're re remembering the customer that that we're here to help. So. Um, it's funny, like it's, um, it can be hard at times because you can't tell someone to go do what needs to be done. You, you've really got to influence or you've really got to, um, help them see, see that problem. So I, 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 suppose, I, I suppose it's in the job, job title because you, you're coaching them to get there rather than telling them what to do. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I'm that person that's in a meeting of saying, um, Hey, what's the problem we're trying to solve again? Or, um, Hey, I think I hear slightly different views on this. Um, um, how can we get aligned? So that's, I, I ask lots of those potentially annoying questions, but, um, I, I, I think they're quite hopeful. <laughs> Oh, for sure. And having spent some time with you, Hugh, and a bit of context for people listening, um, I met you when we both worked at Seek for, for a short period and and you were, you know, instantly a very easy person to get along with. You, you obviously have a lot of empathy for people. Um, I would imagine that they're very uh, important skills in being a coach and, and having, having, you know, the, the position to ask those, uh, as you described them, sort of sometimes annoying questions. Yeah. Um, what other soft skills do you think are really important for someone in your role um, or someone, kind mm. of, I guess, aspiring to be uh, in a role like you that, that, that are really important? Yeah. I, I think you hit on probably the biggest, which is empathy. I think that's um, if, if you're coming in, um, looking to bulldoze or, or assert, you, you, you're probably going to have a really tough time. Um, so I definitely think empathy, I think, um, emotional intelligence and, and perceptiveness. I think that they're, they're two really important things. Like, um, I spend a lot of time just observing, getting baselines. Um, I think as well, um, I'm working on brevity. <laughs> um, but yeah, like I, I, I think particularly the, the human side of it and, and, and being able to um, maybe foster conversation, uh, foster questions 
um, or, or, or reflection. I think that they're, they're really important things, but um, I, I'd say mainly empathy um, and observation. And then, and then I'd probably say um, like influence. And so uh, that, I think that has a negative connotation, but um, I, I, I view it really as um, uh, trying to get someone to see a different perspective or, or to understand a different perspective. I think, yeah, you can call that guidance, I think, instead of yeah. influence and it's the same <laughs> yeah, yeah. thing, right? Like it, yeah. it's the, the positive positive aspects of that. And one thing that I'd be interested to get your take on, Hugh, is that in our chat before um, coming on today, you spoke a lot about the importance of like doing market research as to what industries you want yeah. to go into and stuff. And we can touch on that in a little bit. But um, there seems to be a piece where it, it it may be useful for people to kind of reverse engineer, okay, what skills am I good at? naturally or inherently and say you are good at you know you have high emotional intelligence and you all of those things that you just described i think a general uh i guess role that people might say okay i've got all these skills of what you just described i might go and be a teacher or, or something yeah. like that um how did you come across being a product delivery coach and yeah. um i guess yeah how, how about you tell us that and i've got a couple of follow-up questions after that as well yeah um so i think a really big thing is um I, so a really long time ago, I worked as tech support and there I learned these really great skills of, of triage and, and finding problems and resolving them. And I learned really quickly that just telling someone that they've got a problem or that a problem exists, um, uh, can create problems sometimes. And because, because, um, uh, people have a lot of, uh, attachments to, to, you know, photos on their computers or things of that nature. And so I, um, I learned really quickly, um, that a lot of the skills that I had in, you know, helping family with technology or, or helping friends build websites, a lot of that came in handy in that role. And I started learning like, Oh, if I start like preparing people for, for this bad news, and if I start talking them through what's going on and what I'm doing as I'm troubleshooting, they got a lot more calm and that they, they built up a rapport and we started laughing and these sorts of things. And so that role taught me a lot of the, um, once you've been yelled at once because someone didn't like that, their hard drives failed, you, you learn really quickly, um, how to adapt. And so, um, so I built up a lot of those, those skills then, um, and, and being in New York, if anyone knows New Yorkers, they're not shy and they will tell you exactly what they're feeling. Um, so being on the other end of that, um, I think I learned a lot of those skills. Then, um, then when I moved to seek, I, um, I moved into a, a data analyst or curator role and, um, I got exposed to agile software development and product development. And from there, I realized that when you're working at such minute detail and these tiny little conversations had all this critical information you needed you, you needed some way of tracking it or some way of um making sure everyone was aligned and and i felt i felt in quite naturally to that role of of helping everyone get aligned in a team um and so a lot of those same schools from apple carried over um and then um during my mba um similar facets but i learned a lot more about um, strategic problem solving, how to be thinking farther ahead than, than, than other people might be, or like, how can we, um, how can you link really tactical work with big picture work? And, and there are a lot of skills that I build up, built up. And I think when you look at them all combined, um, that's why the product delivery coach role became really attra attractive because it's got a human element, it's got a tactical element, and then it's got a really big strategic element. And, and, I've always loved building stuff. So I think um, all those things combined is really how, how I got there. When you were talking about CQ, you mentioned agile product development. Could you just yeah. take us through what that actually means? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, so um, uh, talking about agile is like opening a can of worms. Like, um, <laughs> We'll put our uh, seatbelts on. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, uh, just uh, there's, there's probably a few different views out there, but um, I, I would say... Um, agile software development is, um, uh, um, uh, like agile is definitely, it, 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 it came out of the world where 
building really complicated software problems, people would spend all this time trying to plan for all, like every problem. And then all of a sudden, six years later, when it was ready, no one wanted the product anymore or it wasn't relevant or the market had moved on. So agile software development is essentially how can, how can we build things and learn really, really quickly and, and build the smallest thing possible to um, ascertain if it's valuable. Um, and, and then once you've done that, um, how can we iterate on that? So making sure that we're only adding valuable pieces to it. And so a part of agile um, is frameworks like Scrum. And so the, that, that's really um, a framework about saying, how can we break down this big problem into lots of small little pieces and we really quickly rally around it um, and we make sure that we're, we're, we're learning really quickly. Um, so if you've ever gone into a, um, a tech team or a software development team and you've seen cards all over the walls, um, people drawing on whiteboards or... Um, um, or, or, or doing these stand-ups or these weird meetings. That's all agile, um, agile software development. And it's, it, it's largely all built on these principles of how can we make um, working software? Um, how can we um, collaborate really effectively? Um, and, and how can we put the customer at the center of that as well? And the, there's a lot more to go into that, but that's effectively it. That sounds like a pretty exciting space to be in. Could you just give us a little bit of a taste of what that environment actually like is from like a cultural perspective? Yeah. Um, so, so a, a, a lot of, a lot of their facets are, um, so like we visualize work because quite often if you talk about really complicated things, people will, all have a slightly different interpretation of that. So that's why we literally write it down and stick it to the wall or, you know, use Trello or Jira. Um, so that's that one element. So re really we're using visualization just to um, get everyone on the same page. Um, we're, uh, we're writing things in a certain way to make sure that we're all thinking of, of the customer. So there's all these, um, there's a lot of facets that, seem really simple, but they do have kind of a powerful kind of reasoning behind them. In terms of what that space is like, um, in software development, there's a lot of people that are extremely technically mind-blowing uh, with, with, with their knowledge and their capabilities and, and, and their strengths. Um, sometimes, though, um, within those worlds, um, uh, they are they are such immensely um, knowledgeable in products, um, but uh, sometimes w we use agile um, or visualization or communication to draw people out of that detail and make sure that we remember to look at the bigger picture. So there's some of the things that like I'm quite often trying to do is like, hey, I, like I understand that we're trying to make this database work this certain way. How, how can how can I bring bring people out of that detail and start saying, but does that actually help the customer or does that add value? Uh, I think you're about to say, I wasn't sure if that answered your question, but I think it yeah, did. And exactly. it, it's a, it's yeah. a really good um, description of, uh, you know, I, I worked in the customer service team, so I wasn't in the tech yeah. side of things, but you see all these stand-ups and the whiteboards and everything going on. And you're like, what is going on there? But I think that that explanation of agile and then those subsets of the strategies that are used are quite, pretty spot on. And so um, I think that's really useful. But, mate, let, let's take a kind of left turn and go back a little bit yeah. in terms of, say, your uh, education journey yeah. and we can start kind of wherever you want maybe uh in terms of what you were thinking about coming out of high school and what you thought you might be doing in your next few steps why don't you think us through through that and kind of what what that first yeah. what those first couple of steps were yeah definitely um i might just quickly um jump back for one second and i'm sure we can um take care of this with the the power of editing um but just what i'd really quickly hit on with with agile is just like four core pieces that or things that I think are core is just collaboration. So if that's writing things on the wall, that's great. If that's conversations, that's great. That's great. Delivering. So that's that like working software piece. So how can we make sure that we're, we're at the end of everything we're building and, and delivering small pieces. So we're not waiting six months to do this really big thing. 
reflection, so that self-improvement. So as a team, we get together and reflect. And lastly is um, Im improve. So that's how can we make sure that we're taking those reflections and, and improving. I, I, I think that's a, a really good summary. So um, if you go into a team and you don't understand what's going on, generally that it's, it's going to fall under one of those four buckets of um, either they're, they're, they're collaborating and, and um, writing things down is helping collaboration, um, delivery, reflection, or, or um, improvement. There we go. Hughes 101 on Agile. <laughs> yeah, perfect. <laughs> um, and then jumping in, um, uh, back to your question, Luke. Um, so from that perspective, what I was thinking out of high school, I would, I had itchy feet. Like all I, um, uh, I grew up in a family where my parents traveled and I was very focused on that. So um, it, from a career perspective, um, what I did immediately after high school, I would say is um, probably what not to do. So I, I enrolled in a course that I thought would give me really generalist skills. So I signed up for a bachelor's of business and I'll be fully honest, I, I probably wasn't the best student at that time at all. Um, but I really had a goal. I really had my mind on just, just keep learning um, and, and, and focusing on a gap year. Um, and so I, I work lots of part-time jobs and things like that to, to fund that. And so, um, then I went backpacking, um, and I learned a lot about myself. Like I'd, I'd say if anything, I learned more about myself backpacking than I had through, through most of, of, of high school. Did you do that solo? Um, I, so I backpacked for, uh, 11 months, which is quite a while. Um, and, and about half of it was with my two best mates. Um, yep. and, and then half of it was, was by myself. So, yep. yeah. I only ask, cause I think, I think they going traveling solo and I think Luke and I've spoken about this and we've both done it ourselves. It's an awesome experience and something that really big advocate for, because you are, you are by yourself and that yeah. is kind of scary, but at the same time, you're, you're there with everyone else that's around you. Like there's so many people yeah. and like one of the little things, particularly when you're in a non-English speaking country is talking to saying hello to someone and not knowing whether they will be even able to respond to you. Like it's, yeah. I find that like a pretty cool experience. Yeah, for sure. And, and, and not being able to lean on like necessarily anyone. And, and so I, I'm definitely not a great linguist. And so <laughs> I learned more Spanish, you know, getting everything wrong um, by backpacking than, than I did with some classes I've sub, subsequently taken um, because you can't just be like, Hey, give me one minute. I'm going to ask a friend <laughs> that speaks Spanish and then I'll come back to you. And um, yeah, so I, I, I definitely think, um, it keeps you on your toes and it forces you to, to adapt. I think if anyone wants to test themselves and once we're able to travel again, a really good exercise is going to a non-English speaking country, leaving your phone and just taking a kind of a credit <laughs> card and, and, and leave, leave everything else in the hostel and just walk around for a day. Yeah, um, for like, sure. like you said, you're just forced to be out of your comfort zone and there's definitely learnings you can take from that. Yeah, um, for sure. But um, that, that, that's really what I was focused on. Um, uh, after, after high school. Um, but then, um, while I was backpacking, I met a lovely lady from the U S and we moved to the U S together. Um, and so I was really lucky to, to land at, at Apple while just after the iPhone had been released. So I saw crazy growth. Um, but through, through the five years that I was at Apple, I got a bit frustrated at, um, feeling like I was stagnating. And so, upon moving back to Australia, I was really looking towards um, how can I build a credential or a skill set that really gives me something that I can launch, launch my career. Cause I felt like I had had a lot of fun and I had learned a lot about myself and I had got myself in a really good place. Um, and, and I felt really like comfortable with the, the human that I was. Um, but career wise, I just didn't feel super comfortable. And it just, and, just to butt in there, sorry, what age was yeah. that when, yeah. when you felt like you were comfortable with yourself and you were ready to go on your, or like start your career? Yeah. So I would have been this, I would have been about 20, 26 at that point, 26 or 27. And so like, 
I would say well and truly adult territory there, but, um, <laughs> but yeah, like it, I, I think it's what I needed to do. And like, I was earning decent money, like, you know, really cool stock options, stuff like that at Apple, but, um, just not, I would say not being challenged and, and every day having, having fun and that that's great. But, um, I always had this urge that there was something more going on. Um, and it was only really once that I, I, um, built up that self-confidence to say, Oh, I, yeah, I, I can do, I can do strategic stuff or I can do this. Um, I think before then I probably had a fair bit of self-doubt. So, um, and I, and I think lots of people have that and, and it's not really solved by, by a, a number or, or a number of birthdays or anything like that. So I think it's really different for each person. And just on that, Hugh, what gave you the confidence in yourself to be like, oh, okay, I, I feel good about myself now. This is what I want to do and I'm going to go after it. Yeah. Um, uh, to say I, like, I got perfect self-confidence would be, um, a stretch, but I'd probably say no. <laughs> and, and, um, I, I, I think just, um, it's similar to what we're talking about. Like I, I moved to New York in 2008, right at the middle of the global financial crisis, or as they call it, the housing crisis. And, um, yeah, just seeing people every day on the, on the train with their box, their subway, like with their box of stuff that after they had been let go and, um, seeing that and like, I landed a job. I progressed in that job. I, um, uh, I, I learned something completely new. Like I didn't know anything about tech support or, or how Apple build products or how software works. And, and I, I learned that all. And so by, by going through that and kind of building a career out of nothing, I started getting a lot more comfortable. I think more importantly, I learned that a lot of, there's a lot of skills that I had that I just didn't really recognize were, were skills. And it's probably the soft skills that we we're talking about before of empathy, being, being comfortable talking to people, um, navigating through really tough conversations with people in, in an empathetic and caring way. Um, so I think there's some of the things. And so I started realizing, Oh, what I was doing in tech support, I can do that to my team. And, and that made me a manager. Or, or, or a leader um, and started really looking after my team the same way that I looked after customers and um, then then sort of saying, hey, there's these problems at the Apple store. Oh, okay, like get a bunch of people together. Um, let's, let's brainstorm. Oh, that's a really great solution. Like, let, let's do that. And so I started seeing similar traits that now I still use in, in as a product delivery coach at Zero. So um, just really tapping the power of that team knowledge and, and things like that. So I, I, I think, I think, um, uh, building like understanding that there were strengths that I had that just because I didn't have a bit of paper certifying them, um, that they, they were still strengths, um, and, and really pressure testing them in New York or around the world, um, really far away from the comfort of where I grew up that I think that built a lot of confidence. I think that's awesome. And so you've come back to Australia after traveling for a while, you're, you're comfortable with yourself as a person um, and you can see how those skills can be applied, you know, in, in the workplace. Let's talk about the decision to undertake the MBA. What, what, what was the driving factor there? Let's talk about what the MBA is um, and then yeah. how you've used it once you've finished. Um, because I think that is kind of a, a thing that people are thinking about. It's like, right, MBA sounds great, but where does it actually yeah. get me afterwards? Yeah. So just before I landed on the MBA, I was like, do I want to go into software development? And, and, and I took some short courses and I was shit. I was really shit. <laughs> um, then, then I tried, um, I was like engineering, like I love this stuff. And then, so I thought I spoke to friends that were engineers and, and they spoke about their day and I was like, Oh, like I would be that annoying person asking everyone 10 million questions and distracting them. And, and I was like, Oh shit. Okay. That's not me. So I went through a couple of things and, I landed on this idea that, well, I, I don't know exactly what I want to do, but what I do want to do is get a bunch of skills that I feel like I've, I've been exposed to, but like I, I've never tested. And, and that's really where the MBA came into um, it, like came into it. And so at the Monash MBA as well, they've got a really cool um, program where every year you, um, sorry, every 
course, you do a consulting project with it. So what you learn, you're always applying. And I'm very much, I only learn once I've applied it. And so um, that really attracted me. And so the fact that you'd learn a bit of marketing, a bit of strategy, a bit of finance um, and, and a bunch of other things, I, I really love that. Um, so that's why, that's why the MBA. I also had this great idea of studying full-time and working pretty much full-time as well, which turned out to be um, on one side a shit decision. <laughs> on another side, actually really good because just before I joined the MBA, I uh, was able to move into Seek's um, AI team. And so that was just, so I was just to interrupt there. What's AI just quickly. Yeah. So artificial intelligence. So um, um, if you now log into Seek um, and, and the ads, the job ads that you see seem more personalized, um, that's the sort of stuff that that team was doing really smart. Other people were building algorithms and I was, I was, um, working with equally smart people. Um, I would say not me included, but we, we, we were curating the data um, and, and the information in a way that they could then build algorithms on top of it. And just, just to jump in there, the, the, the reason why the data is important is because the algorithm learns through running through the data. So if, if an algorithm doesn't have any data, then it, it can't make decisions. Exactly. So um, uh, right now, most, most things are using, um, uh, machine learning. And so what that means is you, 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 you feed it heaps and heaps of historical data and you train it on that historical data in a certain way. And, and, and then it starts seeing patterns. And then, so what happens is then you can feed it, um, data that it's never seen before. And based upon all that learning that it's done, it, it can start making, um, very, very informed decisions based upon it. And, and, and that's where like, um, if you, if you watch a lot of YouTube videos about Joe Rogan or, you, you know, um, uh, AFL football, whatever it is, um, if you watch a bunch of those, then all of a sudden you're going to start noticing all your recommendations are going to be that, that, that same topic or, or really similar. And that's because millions of people have watched those videos. So they know what you're likely going to, to want. And that's really simplified, but yeah. Oh, I think it's a Does great explanation. Help? No, no, definitely, yeah. definitely, definitely. Yeah. Um, so I, I was essentially the person feeding the machine. I was just feeding, feeding it data. Oh, cool. All right. Well, we've spoken about the the reasons why. Why don't yep. you run us through maybe a bit more detail what the MBA looks like in terms of day to day time commitment? And I know you you touched on that you were working full time and yeah. studying full time. Like yeah. it's a, obviously a postgraduate degree, so a lot of people are doing it say after school. Yeah. Uh, sorry, after work. Do you want to run us through what that looks like in some you know in real life uh, examples? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, so and 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 just before I got distracted, what I was about to say is in some ways doing studying and working was a shit decision from like, uh, my sleep, not like <laughs> amount of hours and my coffee intake went through the roof, but it, it was actually really good because whatever I learned, I could apply mm. and whatever, and seek is a really on, open and transparent company. And so, um, I could easily search on Slack strategy documents and a lot of them would appear. And so I was able to, whatever I learned in the MBA, I could see like a really world-class leading comp, how, how a world-class leading company was doing it. So I would say anyone out there, um, don't view, um, don't view your, um, if, if you do want to move um, industries or roles, um, being in a current role is actually really powerful at times for, for my experience. Um, so in terms of what the MBA was like, so um, uh, it, it was essentially from 6 to 9 p.m. a, a couple of nights a week. Um, so, so that's how I made it work. And then pretty much all weekends you had weekend classes as well. And so I, I really like the Monash MBA because it was a cohort based. So for two years, you were with all the same students. You weren't sort of chopped in change. So you built like a really strong network. Um, so, yeah. And on that network point, I think uh, we've spoken to another guy who was thinking about doing an MBA or is in the process of doing some market research on that. What are the main benefits of the MBA and I assume it'll be networking, but do you want to talk to that a little bit um, and the people that you get to, to work with and who are in the cohort? So I, I think the main benefit for me was um, 
the main benefit was getting that really diverse experience. So I, I had studied Bachelor of Business with a focus in marketing. So I knew a, li- a little bit about marketing. I'd probably forgotten most of it. Um, but I had really gone deep on technology. So I just wanted to understand about sales. I wanted to understand about strategy. I wanted to understand about these other things. And the MBA was really good at that. The other, like the other really important things with the MBA is building a network. So you, you, you get um, to know a bunch of people at a bunch of companies and you, you understand what drives them, you know, um, what their workplace is like, what challenges they have. I think also you learn a lot about yourself. Um, so you understand, oh, I never thought of myself as a creative person, but going through an MBA, I realized that like I'm quite creative at coming up with solutions and, um, and like innovative sort of ways of thinking about things. So um, previously I had no idea about that. I also learned that I'm really shit at some things as well. And <laughs> they're really great things to buddy up with someone in an MBA to say, Hey, can you teach me finance and I'll teach you, you know, design thinking or, or agile software develop. They're, they're probably the main pieces, but like, uh, depending on the MBA, a really important bit is that you, you start doing consulting projects. So you, you actually, they actually let you or unleash you on businesses and, and have you trying to solve their problems that built a huge amount of confidence in saying, Oh, okay. These things that like we've been solving, they, these are real world problems. And if you want to become a consultant or, um, if you want to move to a more senior role, these problems aren't that different um, than what that than what I've done in the MBA. So I think elevating you to a certain like um, severity of problems, but also teaching you to some simple frameworks on how to think through problems, how to approach them. Um, I, I think they're really powerful things that the MBA teach you. Oh, it sounds like a fantastic program. Yep. A bit of a left for field question. One of the key themes that's been coming out throughout our conversations to date has been personal brand. What what are three companies that you would use to describe your own personal brand? Three companies to describe my own personal brand. Oh, good question. Zero, if I had to characterize them, I'd say they're a really human company. So they're always looking out for people. I think that's a really Kiwi like component of it. And, yeah. um, so I would, I would really identify with that. Like I, I'm, um, I struggle to think about big structural change without thinking of humans, or I, I really struggle to, um, think about things that we're changing without thinking, oh, maybe that accountant that's done it that way for a thousand, like, you know, you know, a thousand days, maybe making that change might really annoy them. How, how can we help? Um, so I'd say human, I'd have to say like a a company, like I quite like the founders of Atlassian, like they're really, they've got a really big, um, uh, megaphone right now. And, and, and the, instead of talking about their business incessantly, they're talking about the impact of COVID-19 on people. They're talking about, um, uh, climate change. Mm. They're big um, on renewable energy. Massive, massive. Like I, I, I one of them did a, a mates rate bet with Tez, uh, you know, Elon Musk Elon about Musk. battery packs for <laughs> South Australia. Like, um, I, I, I think I like that, that, uh, I'd probably say at last in like, um, uh, I really like that they, um, that they, they're using their megaphone for, for good. Yep. Um, yeah. Number three, number three, I, I'd have to say some kind of small business. So like maybe my local cafe or something like that, just, yeah, um, all that, yeah. caffeine. <laughs> Sorry? all that caffeine. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Or, or, and just like small people doing something that makes them really happy. Like, um, I think authenticity, like that's something that I've really been focusing on lately is just being trying to be a lot more authentic. And you, you, I think that takes a bit of bravery. And I think, um, opening up a small business takes a lot of bravery. So, oh, yeah. for sure, uh, mate. Just I think a good one that we've been uh, spruiking to some people uh, to wrap things up on is for some advice to to younger people and be they students or someone that's working in industry and maybe wanting to make a change or, or make a next move. 
What yeah. is some maybe a motto or uh, some advice that you would put on a billboard for for all of them to see at, at one point? And and yes, I am stealing that from from Tim Ferriss's podcast, <laughs> <laughs> but I think it's a really good question, and yeah, there's been yeah. some really good advice come from that. So, does anything come to mind? It's not really a really catchy kind of phrase, but I think one thing that I uh, like I always come back to is um, there's really there's really easy. Um, like small cheap ways of uh, validating validating problems, or um, if I put on my tech support hat of triaging problems, and I think that's one thing that like I would come back to is really trying to um, champion um, how can you make really small experiments um, and and um, really de-risk um, the big decisions that you make in life, and so that might be. Um, grab a coffee, um, you, you, you grab a coffee with someone that's currently in the role that you're interested about and just ask really brave questions. Or, um, that might just be, um, Hey, I want to start a podcast. Um, well, I'll, I'll go out there and may, may, maybe I'll struggle with that, but, um, it, it's better to, it's better to do it, um, right now when everyone's at home and, and we can try it and, and see how it goes. Um. And, and like going back to Tim Ferriss, like when he talked about um, releasing his first book, he was doing similar things. Like he would, um, uh, he would have a bunch of um, um, Google like design and or, or yeah. And, and designs for his book. And, it, mm. and he would literally get like um, book art and wrap it around an existing book and put it in a store and see what people picked up. Like what, what books, uh, what, what designs they, they picked up more often. And so that's how we decided on that. So I, I think that's one thing I'm really passionate about is, um, in life, we make these really big decisions. How, how can we, um, get a little bit of data and experiment with them? I think, I think that's fantastic advice. So you uh, just like to say, thanks for coming on the show, mate. It's been awesome yeah. to chat to you about what being a product delivery coach is and, uh, to learn learn more about the MBA pro, pro, program at Monash and yeah. where that can take you. Absolutely. Awesome. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure chatting today. I appreciate it, mate. Cheers.